My name is Eric Pickle, I'm the project and workshop manager for Seacor International. And I'd like to begin by recognizing the traditional owners of this land and, uh, and their, um, their elders past, uh, present, and emerging. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, two pieces of technology that we've been developing to aid in the local propagation of corals. Um, for those unfamiliar with Seacor, <coughs> We are a nonprofit organization focusing on uh, research, restoration, and education and outreach um, uh, for coral. And over the last 10 years, we've focused a number of our efforts on refining and improving methodologies for the sexual uh, production of corals for, uh, for restoration. Um, recently, um, uh, in 2017, we entered into a partnership with the California Academy of Sciences, the Nature Conservancy, um, to, uh, to start the Global Coral Restoration Project, along with other partners and on-site uh, collaborators. The goal being to advance the science and technology needed for large-scale restoration and to demonstrate the capability of scaling up um, some of these restoration techniques. Um, there's an initial focus for the project in the Caribbean and with sexual propagation, uh, but the idea being that as it grows and matures, we would expand to include other techniques, microfragmentation, direct seeding, uh, perhaps others, um, as well as move into other locations. Um, several other speakers throughout the week have, have done a good job of talking about the potential benefits of uh, sexual propagation. Peter Harrison did a great job of doing this, and I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time talking about it, but it's these advantages that um, are, are why we put a lot of our efforts towards these type of techniques. Um, the ability to potentially increase genetic diversity in the populations that we're working with by allowing them to sexually uh, reproduce before using them for restoration. The ability to produce uh, large numbers. It's not unreasonable to produce hundreds of thousands, if not millions of corals uh, per spawning event per species. Um, and the, uh, the potential to produce these numbers with, um, with less labor than is uh, possible with some of the other methodologies, thus potentially making it a cheaper alternative and something that uh, has uh, some potential for large scaling. Um, and so those who are unfamiliar with what we're doing, we are um, utilizing the coral life cycle and, and the coral reproductive cycle to, uh, for restoration. So we are collecting gametes, um, uh, I'm going to put a random seed somewhere in there, uh, collecting gametes um, from naturally spawning corals, we are then rearing them, uh, fertilizing and rearing them to, uh, to their larval phase. We are then introducing them to artificial substrates that we call seeding units um, and allowing them to settle on those and then outplanting those settled substrates onto the reef. So we've gotten pretty good at doing this for 5,000, 10,000 corals, 5,000, 10,000 seeding units at a time. Uh, what we would like to do is demonstrate our capability to do this for hundreds of thousands, if not millions at a time. And we set a motivational goal of by 2021 outplanting a million of these at our uh, field sites. Um, so one of the uh, drawbacks, or perhaps it's an advantage of speaking late at the conference, is that a bunch of people have already beat you to the punch of a lot of things you want to talk about. So maybe you've seen these pictures um, in a number of other presentations. These are the the Seacore tetrapods and seating units that we've been using over the last five years. Um, they're made of concrete. They're about the size of your fist. Um, and we came up with these out of a design process that we entered into five, six years ago. Um, there were a number of ideas that came out of that process. We ended up doing field trials with two of them and then settling on kind of that type two version uh, to your right that you're seeing there for, uh, for our work over the last five years. You'll see that we have a, a ridge on each one of those legs. That is the, the microhabitat there. Um, and one of the things that we were designing these for was the potential to be self-settling, um, so that they would not need to be manually attached to the roof, so that one could sow them like you would sow seeds in a field, uh, that you could broadcast them from a boat or from some other um, uh, vehicle, and they would uh, find nooks and crannies in the reef to settle themselves into, uh, giving the corals time to grow and attach to the reef without the need for manual attachment. Uh, thus, hopefully, decreasing labor and decreasing costs. Um, what you'll see in this lower uh, right-hand uh, plot is the increased survival that we've seen of corals that, is, that have settled in that microhabitat, in those ridges. Um, so not only is there a preference of the uh, coral larvae to settle into those ridges, um, there is increased survivability of those that do. 
uh, which, which tracks pretty well with uh, the presentation Andrew Hayward gave on Tuesday and, and a lot of what you see in literature from other places. Um, so in very broad brushstrokes, uh, without spending too much time on this, these are some takeaways from, from what we've seen over the last five years of trials with these. Um, in Curacao, we're seeing five, 50 to 70% retention of these seating units on the reef, meaning that we're retaining more than half of them. There's certainly some room for improvement there, um, which we're, we're hoping to design into these, these next units. Um, and we've seen sur survival uh, over a year on each one of these to 10 to 15% um, at our sites in Curacao. Um, this contrasts a bit with our work in Mexico, where we've had similar uh, substrate retrain retainment, um, but we've seen significantly lower survivability on the tetrapods that we've outplanted there. And, and one of the things that this, I think, highlights is that there is no magic bullet for doing this. We're not going to be able to use one methodology and have it work in every location. Um, so whereas where we can perhaps outplant uh, corals in Curacao 10 days, 14 days after settlement and, and, and get acceptable survival, survival from that, um, in a place like Mexico, it might require an additional investment in uh, husbandry and growing things out for longer periods of time to get the survival that we want. Um, and so what we, um, what we wanted to do is take the lessons that we've learned and the data we had over the last five years and, and, and redesign these units to, to hopefully improve on some of that retainment and improve on some of that post settlement mortality. Um, and so we, uh, with support from the California Academy of Sciences and some engineering support um, from the Autodesk Foundation, we assembled a working group and worked with some designers to uh, to take what we, what we, our ideas for this and the constraints that we had and come up with a number of designs that perhaps might be an improvement. So some of the things that we wanted to do was to optimize these for large scale production. The current tetrapods are made by hand in these small molds, uh, which is fine for producing five or 10,000 of these at a time. Our team in Mexico is, is, is busy for a good portion of the year doing this, but if we want to make hundreds of thousands or millions of them, that's not a sustainable manufacturing method. Uh, we also wanted them, similar to the tetrapods, to be able to self-settle. We wanted to build an attractive microhabitat on there that corals wanted to settle in and also provide additional shelter for their early uh, life stages. And um, we wanted to reduce competition with a, a marriage of uh, surface texture and material. And so the needle that we really wanted, want to thread here is to have something that is acceptable for corals to settle on, but is more difficult for some of their competitors like algae or sponges or things like that to sell on. Um, and we needed these to be relatively inexpensive. Our goal is to get the cost of outplanting one coral uh, through the whole process below a dollar, hopefully well below a dollar. To do that, we have to hit uh, pretty particular price points for these seeding units. Uh, so we, uh, we came out of the other side of this process with seven um, designs that we really like. And these are the seven designs that we're going to be testing during the spawning season this year. We'll take a little bit of a closer look at these uh, in this picture. Um, in our material experiments, um, the material that kind of rose to the top as, as kind of threading that needle uh, for reducing competition was unglazed ceramic. Um, and so corals were happy to settle on this, and, and we saw that this helped to inhibit some of the growth of some of the competitors. So all of these are in some form of unglazed ceramic with kind of varying uh, surface textures on them. Uh, there are a number of microhabitats that we're kind of exploring through these. And we ended up 3D printing all of these uh, as a manufacturing method. Um, and that, that uh, allowed us a number of advantages. One of them, we could do some uh, rapid prototyping uh, as we went through the design process. And also, we didn't have to invest in, in some of those initial costs of, of creating molds or tooling machinery to do this. We could, uh, it allowed us a bunch more flexibility to take these, test these in these small runs, and then look at uh, potentially other manufacturing methods moving forward. Uh, and, unless, you know, it is possible that 3D printing could be a large-scale manufacturing method if uh, costs continue to uh, kind of go down with uh, capability. Um, so we just started doing the first trials with these in Curacao with uh, the Pluria labyrinthiformis uh, spawned in June in Curacao. Um, so we have some very additional, just really uh, few week results here. We're going to be doing no choice assays in the lab, some choice experiment, experiments in the pool. We're going to be tracking post settlement survival and re tracking retention on the reef. And I don't want to spend too much time on, on these and this are re results. These don't include any survivability. This is just settlement. Um, except to say that uh, we're encouraged that, uh, for the most part, these are showing similar settlements, uh, comparable settlements to the concrete tetrapods. The expectations uh, for increases that we're hoping to make are not in settlement, but in post-settlement survival. So that we're seeing 
Uh, consistent settlement on these is, is a good first sign, we think. But we're going to be doing this in four different locations with uh, four to five different species, so there'll be a lot more data to come from this as we get through the year. Uh, the other technology I want to touch on briefly here today is uh, the development of uh, these in-situ larval rearing pools. The idea being um, that by developing methodology and technology for an entire, entirely in-situ op operation uh, uh, gives you some, some, some options and it opens up the number of places that you can work in. A lot of the places we're going to want to be able to do this work in are either from a cost or space or logistics standpoint are not going to be able to create large land-based nurseries. And so by having an entirely in situ operation, we're able to uh, work in a number of other places and avoid some of the costs of setting up some of that infrastructure. Um, this idea is, uh, is, is coming from uh, Amori and his team in Japan who have been doing this for decades uh, and raising corals in these pools. You can see in the bottom two pictures some of our early trials with, um, with pool designs. And the, the, the general process of this is that we take these seeding units, put them in crates, and suspend them within these pools. When we have fertilized embryos, we dump those embryos in there. They develop into larvae, settle on the seeding units in the pools, and then grow out for a period of time before they're out and onto the reef. And we've had some, uh, I would call it mixed success with these. Um, we've been able to raise a number of batches that have, have done wonderfully. The failures that we have had have been mostly due to resilience of the pools themselves, either from currents that, that, that kind of knock them in or structurally compromise them, uh, waves crashing over the top, things like that. So in designing new versions that we're uh, looking to uh, work out for this year, we, that resilience was kind of one of the big things that we wanted to build into this. We want these to be able to be deployed in the areas uh, where they're going to be most useful. Uh, so similar to the seeding unit work, we put together a working group and are working with a production company in the States that actually makes uh, inflatable boats, like inflatable rafts for like river rafting. Um, and we have the first prototype that we deployed along with that uh, aforementioned the Florias Fani in June in Curacao. Um, and uh, looking at this, you can kind of see a little bit of a raft in there. Think of a raft with uh, where the people sit drops down into a tank. And so you can kind of separate the design of these into three different aspects in there. Uh, modular to a certain degree uh, with this inflatable tube at the top, this kind of skirt that is the tank that kind of comes over the side and buckles in, and then a canopy over the top that keeps the rain and waves out. Um, and so these things are uh, four meters long, two meters wide, two and a half meters deep. We can get 1,400 to 1,600 seating units in them, and we, we believe we can scale that either up or down depending on what we think idealized volumes are as we move forward uh, with the trials if this proves to be a successful design. Um, so like I said, we have the, the first one of these um, deployed in, in Curacao. I don't have much data on this. This is really only a few weeks old. All I have here is temperature data showing that we are not creating coral soup in here by creating this greenhouse of the larvae that we're putting in. Um, it held up to the conditions in the channel that we deployed it in, so uh, thumbs up uh, to start with, and, and we'll see what the settlement data looks like. And we'll have a bunch more uh, data from, uh, from other sites um, and with other species as we, as we move forward. Um, and so kind of leading to the wrap up here, uh, we're continuing uh, the development on these. Um, we're going to input the, the, the data and the lessons we learn uh, through this spawning season into another iterative design process to establish the versions of both the seeding units and the pools that we'll work with in 2019. Uh, we're also working on our, our outplanting technology and that's kind of one of the, the next steps of what we're looking at is the best way to deliver these seeding units to the reef at large scale, as well as process engineering, looking from manufacturing to deployment um, and where we can find its efficiencies and continue to bring these costs down. So the slide I'm not going to be able to do anywhere adequate justice to and thinking about people who make this possible and all of our partners on the ground. And with that, um, I'll take any questions. <laughs>